set up a, a drawing and then uh, we'll try to play it. So presumably in class, you are, you are working from the model, you have that information on your paper. Then you either in class proceed to try to play one part of it or you take it home and do the leg, the arm, or whatever. So I set up some situations and then take some of it apart. So there's really two, two things going on here. One is you get to watch me set up a drawing, or two or three, and then we'll take part of it apart. So let's say, let's try the shoulders. External notch, midline, axis for head and neck, pitch of pelvis, you can't see, move in or find another spot, supporting leg, leg off to the side for balance. This might be a little exaggerated, we'll see in a minute. But uh, with about eight or nine lines, I have the whole thing going. Then, uh, if that seems reasonable, perhaps we'll have an arm over here. Later on, we'll do something here. I don't know what with the arm. The arm is not critical at this point. Then, try to envelop all of this, this armature, with uh, some simple shapes. And uh, maybe somewhat exaggerated, hopefully anatomically possible. Maybe if I do this, it's a little more reasonable, and move this over. So don't be afraid when you're setting up a drawing to introduce revisions. So this is not where it belongs. It has the right components, but uh, there's sternum, upper abdomen, waist. Waist is just in the rib cage. <coughs> Lower abdomen, the pelvis, maybe it's there. This little side piece here is external black muscle. Classic line, pelvis. I've spent a lot of time on this section. We haven't done anything here really, and nothing here. So it's, it's dangerous to take one part of the drawing too much in advance. Leg. Why would I choose this leg? This is the supporting leg. Better to get this person standing, perhaps with this leg first, and then this to assist it. Now, the information from anatomy is already being used, obviously. We've got two or three overcuts already. You know what overcuts are, one form cutting in front of another. If you can display those somehow or other, then you generate information in that particular <coughs> area. Position with the leg. This is extremely important to assess correctly the angle of the foot planted on the stand, and you should take some time to consider how long this side plane of foot is when compared to how great the front plane of the foot is where the toes are to determine the effect of the planted foot, and on the side, drop to the leg. And always, when I'm starting, this leg, I would look immediately to the negative space situation right here to see if that's what we really want on the model or not. Drop, <coughs> leg, lead. You know, if it doesn't move, if it fails in that department, it's all over. So let's see down here. We've already got an overcut. I'll show you where the overcuts are already. I've snuck a few of them in here. Angle for foot. See if that looks reasonable. Head over here. What I usually do is to jump from sternal notch to chin, hook on the jaw, off of head. If this jump is sufficient, 
and at the right angle and the right distance, you get enough neck and you get the head in the right place. Pop of head off can usually be uh, aimed that way. There's a flat plane and the face is generally convex, bumped out. I don't want that too big.
basic shape of all of this area here at the knee is controlled by the shape of the bones. The femur comes down and it's rather square and it plants itself on the tibia, which is like a, like a column receiving the weight up above it. And so you need this sort of configuration if you hear all this if you hear. If the knee fails in your drawing, it's because it's not bony enough. In, a, in an extended leg, which this is, a straightened leg, the patella rides above the joint. So if you can find the patella, you know where the joint is, just below it, on an extended leg. In a flexed leg, it's interesting, this strap, this tie piece from the patella to the little bump of tuberosity on the tibia, when you flex your leg, this strap, since it's not elastic, pulls this right into the interface where in flexing your knee, this would be a vulnerable spot. So right in the space is where the patella would be pulled by having your lower leg flex. So all of this in through here is bony, you have to check it out, and of course the patella, and the little knob here, the porosity patches, and then the shin. The shin is superficial to that surface. It becomes the inner ankle bone. Up and through here, you don't see the feet. So you have the inner ankle bone, or medial malleolus. I think that's archaic to use that term, but it, that's what it is. And then lateral, upper ankle bone. They aren't exactly opposite each other. They're shifted, so the inner one is higher. And then at the foot, you have the long arch or longitudinal arch from heel to toe. And you have a, the transverse arch from one side to the other. So that's all controlled by the bony. So that would be a, uh, a review of just locating some of the bony information on that drawing. Let's go to another one. And maybe look at the pelvis and the articulation with the thorax. Again, simply, I want to go through this whole thing to get a simple statement of what we're doing with this drawing, what we're going to try to do. So, this is sternum, side view, figures facing this way. Axis for head and neck. We'll flex that so that it's on the page. The pitch of the pelvis. That's on your diagram. Pelvis, you might think of as a box. In this view, very much rotated. Don't think of it as just a column. Don't think of the torso as just a column of stuff. There are masses that pitch against each other. Leg.
that bone, the iliac crest of the pelvis. Down into here would be trochanter, but let's get something for this leg. First, check the proportions. Looks like we'll be all right on the page. We used to draw a line like this from the anterior inferior iliac spine. What did it say? There are two bumps on the front of the bone here. You take the lower one, draw a line back below the trochanter, and so this will be hip, this will be leg. We used to do that in sculpture. If you could think of it that way, trochanter is right at, right at that juncture. The basic rhythm of the leg, as you know, is full in the upper leg in front, full in the lower leg in back. That's the general rhythm of the leg in this position. So anatomically, obviously there's no connection front to back, but visually there may be. So we'll keep that in mind. Dust that down. About halfway down is knee. But I don't offer that as a rule because you're going to get somebody doing this sometime and then it changes the proportion. Here's an overcut. What does he mean, overcut? This form dives to leg here. This form comes from around and back from lower part of pelvis and shoots to lower leg. A is in front of B. Overlaps. So I have this rhythm in mind, but I can't just draw it as, like, as a single continuous line when I'm developing the, the construction here. Ankle. If you leave the ankle out, you know what happens? This looks like a sock. The 
It's a muscle that looks like it's on the side of the leg, on the upper leg. It's held in partly by a strap that works its way to the front and is classified as being part of the front group or fastest muscles, quadricep muscles of the leg. And then you have to ask yourself, what does it hitch to? What does it do? Hitches to patella, kneecap, and patella hitches to lower leg. So this muscle would pull on patella, pull on lower leg, extend leg, fastest lateralis. In the center, let's see, this would be a little more full. In the center, there would be the rectus femoris muscle, the straight one, probably the, the muscle that would give an accounting of that profile. And then we've got a space back here. All these belong to the front of the leg. The exception of this strap it runs back to the side of the lower leg. And then this wedge is in, and then this emerges. This is the one you see time and time again right here. The straight strap running from behind the leg, tying on the lower leg at the fibula. Biceps of the leg. Yes? Is the uh, band running from the tensor to the Excuse me? Is the band running from probably, uh, the, yeah, from the tensor to the yes. tibia? Is that the iliosa of the band? Yes, and it's joined partly by fibers from the gluteus maximus, but for the sake of clarity of showing these elements, I'm not I'm taking that off. This little strap connects the pelvis to lower leg. When you stand and keep your legs extended as you would have to over a period of time, don't you see to use these big vastus muscles would not be as efficient. We use up a lot of power. In place of that, you have a look, you have a strong strap that's going to take the place of tensing these vastus muscles. When you stand, and it's only a little muscle right here, this muscle contracts, pulls this strap. This strap is located far enough toward the front of side of leg so that when you stand, you're only using this little pitsy muscle to extend your leg and stand up instead of all these things. It would be much less efficient. It as you would do in a sit up, so this ties with the bone. 
and then cut out two derivatives five, six, and seven. Very schematically drawn here. Cutting the rib cage. And on the side, this muscle. It's stepped in a way like this, but I'm simplifying it for now to give you a kind of a basic plan of how to go around the force. This is the external oblique muscle, which basically only shows up as a flank pad right here, like a parallelogram. It's that shape. And this lower margin of it is iliac crest. So I think the thing to do now is, after having given you a, a feel of what it looks like when you play it, I want to just give you a very simple plan of how to begin to think of the construction of the uh, floor plan. This was an idea set forth by the fellow that wrote that anatomy book that I recommend that everybody has, Dave Rubens. It's a good idea, very simple. Uh, front view. see a little of that side muscle. So let's put that on this way. Very skinny at the top where it ties to separate ribs. Very, very thin and fatter down here. Side muscle. Diagram of front view of torso. Side view. Pitch the rib cage. Pitch the pelvis. Side muscle ties to last rib and straight to the pelvis. 
see there's an overcut there. We don't see really the any mass to this muscle in this zone at all. It's all just basically rib cage. It's there. It's extremely lean. Right here, it builds up. You should see this. Overcut. This bulges out in front of that. So you see to the box, the top of that box is the iliac crest. And then the back muscle, you see some up. Post muscle. Heaviest in this region where it has three bundles more or less coming together. That's a simple view of torso. It's not a bad idea. And then the hitch on leg, you skip down on this box. Find the front, go down, start leg here, draw a diagonal. This will be hip or gluteus medius. This will be where trochanter is. Leg starts from here. You can't start leg from up here. You start leg down here. And then from back here. So a simple view of construction of basic muscles of the torso. One other idea, let's do a three-quarter view, and then I want to stop and recapitulate all this stuff. Three quarter of you. In fact, I think in an effort to keep this simple, I don't even think Rubens had this on there. I think he just had sort of a shape. A paper shape. Outside view. It's Muscle located on the hip here, 
this muscle will tie to leg and move it out. So these fibers, when we talk about that, are going to go from this anchor point to the leg, crossing a joint, so something can happen. So it's not a bad model, and on it goes. One good thing that it does, it begins to reveal this little flat plane in life. And in life, this is covered with a fat deposit, so this little flat plane continues all the way across here. So you wind up with this shape, oftentimes on the model. Usually referred to as a plastic model. The paralysis major and everything else up in here. Yes, what? The space, the white space between the uh, ring and the is that very busy. Yeah. I'm separating these things out a little bit to make them distinct. Actually, these fibers cross a little bit. The next layer down, the fibers do this. The next layer back, the fibers do this. So you have a whole meshing network of muscles that cut across at different angles across the uh, as far as the course. Um, questions on this? Back view, you can assume what that is. It's just long post muscles going up. You have a drawing on your hand up. Let me try this quickly. One other drawing and just play it for you. without a whole lot of talk. in your head what this contour is because you want to have this fit with this. Sartorius does start from the top. That's a 
cross divides Sebastian's group from adductor group. So the direction up and through here is essentially from outside to inside. Here's Sebastian's lateral.